I'm going to submit to you that every problem in your life is a wisdom problem. Amen. Think about it. Think about how do I raise my kids? A wisdom problem. Do I take this job? Do I don't take this job? A wisdom problem. Someone so hurt me, offended me. What do I do? How do I respond? That's a wisdom problem. How do I, how do I answer this? What kind of letter do I write? You make thousands and thousands of choices every single day of your life, and most of them are wisdom problems. Number two, the word of God is the wisdom of God. And your respect for the word of God is your respect for God. That's just the truth. Number three, the secret of your future is hidden in your daily routine. Okay, think about that. The very secret of your future is hidden in your daily routine. And so... I'm going, to call, I'm going to make some people examples today that are my friends, so if I embarrass you, I apologize in advance. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But my friend Nina, <laughs> she's spoken out. I'm already forgiven. My friend Nina gets up early and seeks the Lord every single day, and her life is a reflection of that. She, she pours out song after song after song from the Lord because she spends every day in the presence of the Lord, and he pours out to her. Lord, this is the same way. This is a woman whose daily routine is to be in the presence of the Lord. And um, sorry, Denville, but I'm going to pick on you too. This man spends hours and hours and hours worshiping the Lord in his private time. And it's very evident the minute you hear him open up his voice before the Lord because the presence of God ushers in the minute he opens his mouth. It's because what's his daily routine? He spends time with the presence of the Lord. I, um, I've, I've led hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of prayer meetings I've, uh, in small groups. And, and so learning what it's like to be in the presence of the Lord. Um, you're... What you do daily. Listen, listen recently, I, a couple years ago, God um, showed me in a prayer room laying on my face before the Lord. He showed me uh, pictures, paintings. And I got up from that time uh, in the Lord's presence and I told Mary, I said, Mary, I, I, was, I think I'm supposed to oil paint. And, um, and she was like, go for it. You know? So then when we moved into this building, I, um, I thought, well, why don't I should... I should move on that. See, I, I wasn't doing it. I had heard the word, and I didn't act on it, and I didn't make it part of my routine. But I decided when we moved into this place that the, we had so many walls that I was like, okay, I'm going to paint and put the paintings on the walls. And, and God started to help me in the painting. And recently, um, the idea, uh, I had a need. And God said, I, I asked the Lord, give me wisdom to know what to do. Because sometimes you just pray in the need. And sometimes he asks you to do something. He'll give you an instruction. Well, the instruction, he says, sell the paintings. And I went, but, you know, I kind of like them around the building. And he goes, sell, release the paintings. So I re started to release the paintings. And, you know, I've sold nine paintings. Wow. Like, that's, that's no small thing. <laughs> and my, my, my dream is to be able to finance kingdom things and even personal dreams through the selling of the paintings, that God would give me, continue to give me favor. But if I don't paint, nothing's going to happen. If I don't every week get before the Lord and paint, nothing will happen. So the secret of your future is hidden in your daily routine. Whoa. Number four, anything permitted increases. Yeah. If you permit disrespect to you, Disrespect will increase. If you, perm if, if you are a place of, of blessing and you show respect, respect to you increases. We, we decided at this church that we were going to be a place that, that loved and honored the worship of our king. And so it's been increasing and increasing and increasing. And he's adding people who are of like heart. Anything permitted increases, whether it be Nintendo, whether it be television. Whatever is permitted 
increases. If abuse is permitted, it will increase. If, if, if um, you know, whether it be your addiction, if you, are, if you don't battle it, it will increase and take over. Whatever you respect, you attract. And like I just said, we respect the presence of the Lord. We respect the worship of the King. We respect the, pre the, the, the preaching of the Word of God. And those are the people that are attracted. That's why you guys are here. Because what you respect, we respect the prophetic. And we say, you know, you don't have to do it all right, and you don't have to do it all perfect, but, we, but, but you know what? The more we operate in this, wh what happens? It's caught. Because you could be a person who's never heard, uh, had an impression, a prophetic impression in your life, and you hang around Jose and Mary and Nina and some of these for just a few minutes, and, in, in a, and as we minister, you start hearing, you start hearing, you start operating, because we're not afraid of it. We respect it, and so we attract it. And God said to us, matter of fact, you're going to attract wounded prophets here. And because they've been rejected in other places, but they're going to find a home here. But we're charged with helping them get healed. So <laughs> we are. So, I mean, we attract it. And, but <laughs> All right, quiet in the peanut gallery. All right. <laughs> All right. Um, when your heart decides the destination, your mind will design the map to reach it. Oh, I just lost my thing. Okay, here we go. So, again, like my heart decided I was going to try this painting thing, and God has started to give me the strategy. And you'll and when and we decided what. We're going to move into this monstrously big building, like outrageous for a church our size. What we have, do we have any business being in here? <laughs> yes, we do, because we, our heart decided the destination, and everyone and says we're going to get the map to get there. You cannot correct what you are unwilling to confront. right? Yeah. You can't correct it, and it's painful, and that's why people do avoid it, right? It's, it's the hard part first, and, but you can't correct what you're unwilling to confront. Crisis always occurs at the curve of change. And that's, boy, been true for us. It's been true in Ralph and my life. We, um, I, I, you know, I go from a lighthearted moment, where, not a lighthearted moment, into something incredibly serious. But um, so many of you here know this, but some of you may not know this, but that um, oh, about eight years ago now, Seems so fast. Time goes so fast. Eight years ago, our our oldest son, who now is 27, so it was actually nine years ago. Um, well, my math. Just forget the math. <laughs> <laughs> our son was 18. So, oh yeah, nine. Okay. <laughs> Carry the one. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, our son was living a double life. He, there was a part of him that wanted to please his dad, and there was a part of him that was getting dragged into the world and that had worldly friends, and so he was dabbling and getting high and doing stuff. And he lived in dread fear that his dad would find out and reject him or that he would get exposed and ruin his father. See, he thought he could bring his dad down. Wow. So imagine living with that. So, And then there's the part of him that... that did kind of sort of believe, so he had his foot in two worlds, and that's a pretty miserable place. So he's a very emotional character. I don't know where he gets that from. <laughs> but anyway, um, he attempted suicide. Our son did. 
And he failed miserably, thank God. He didn't take anything that could have really, 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 really killed him. But he was very disappointed when he woke up. He, he, he wasn't happy about it. He, was, um, he wished he wished, at that moment, he wished he would have succeeded. So he came into my room hysterically crying, hysterically crying, confessing what he had done. And so we were pastors at the Miami Vineyard, and um, we, we have a policy. We put, we put all of our, our junk in the light. We th- think that's like the best way to do it, you know. He says, walk in the light as you're in the light, you know. So we went to our, we went to our senior pastor, and we said, this is what's going on in our family. What do you want us to do? And he says, well... Um, why don't you guys go into counseling? Why don't you guys go to, into counseling as a family? And so, so we went into counseling, and there had been, st- like right, right now, Ralph and I are going to celebrate our 30th year of marriage this year. Wow. You know, 30 years, more than half my life. <laughs> and at, but at that, at that time, so that we were like married 21 years, there had been so many things unbroken in our marriage. There had been, you guys know, you guys know, like, you know that if you say this, he'll say this, you'll say this, he'll say this, it'll go around and around, it'll never get resolved. It just, it ends, and there's no resolution, and you get frustrated, they're frustrated, and there's no coming together. And so, we were the ones that were more screwed up than our son, is what I want to say. But it took that crisis to get us where we needed to go so that we would change. And let me tell you, had we not gone through that and the Lord exposed false belief systems, the Lord healed deep, deep wounds, had we not gone through that and gotten our marriage at a place, do you think I, I, we would have never planted this church? We would have been squashed like a bug right out the door. <laughs> we would have. We would have gotten squashed like a bug right outside the door because there were... You know, and he's still working on us. We're real slow learners on some of these things. <laughs> but crisis always occurs at the curve of change. <laughs> so, and boy, has there been dramatic change. Our life is getting better and better and better and better and better. So never rewrite your theology to accommodate a tragedy. Isn't it tempting? Like something doesn't go, and so we try to, you know, we try to say, well, God is this way or whatever, and we don't, we don't get to change who he says he is. We don't get to change the word of God. We don't get to change any of these things to accommodate um, things. You know, you never outgrow warfare. You simply must learn to fight. You won't outgrow it, but you must learn to fight. So the reward of pain is the willingness to change. You wouldn't think that's a reward, would you? But it is a, it's a reward. That's, that's how important it is. I mean, I look, at, I look at now the change that God's done and is continuing to do, and it's a reward. We would have had a broken relationship with our son. We would have perpetuated some very unhealthy things. We would have perpetuated dysfunction instead of wholeness and healing. We would have, you know, God would have still loved us. He still would have used us. He uses all of us in all the different stages that we are and all the different places of our journey. But to be able to impart life and not something crooked or twisted is, is huge. So the reward of pain is the willingness to change. And oh my gosh, are some of us so, so hard to get us to be willing to change because we are blind. We're blind. And so willingness to change is big just in itself. Greatness is not the absence of a flaw, but the willingness to overcome it. Isn't that good? That's my husband. He's great. I'm serious. I'm dead serious. He is a great man. You are a great man. You are a great man. <laughs> Not because he is without flaws, but I've never seen 
a more humble man in all my life. He admits it when he sees it. <laughs> you can't admit what you don't see, right? What you're blind to. But, he, but how many times have you seen him humble himself and expose his stuff? I, I don't go as low as this man. You guys don't know my junk like he's... You know, you don't. But because he's so willing to overcome, he's so willing to make himself the example. And so willingness is not the absence of a flaw, but you are great if you are willing to overcome it. Jose, you are great. You are great because this, this past year when, when you watch those videos and the Father's heart and God just ripped you open and said, look at, how, look at how you've been treating your children. Look how you lost their hearts. Look, you, you, you were willing to overcome it. Each act of obedience shortens the distance to any miracle you are pursuing. Wow. <laughs> this one is, is great. I mean, Um, this one, um, each act of obedience, um, I'm going to use you, Mary, as an example. <laughs> Mary was in a service in Father's Day, and Ralph put letters, uh, cards up here at the front, and he said, anybody want to write something to your father, come up here and write a letter, and the Holy Spirit says to her, write a letter to your father. And she obeyed. She obeyed. And, and her miracle is, is, she's seen miracles. Why? Because she humbled herself and she affirmed him. Sometimes when, when people, when, when you've had a rough time relationally with people and they've said a lot of things to hurt you and a lot of, a lot of stuff has gone down the pike, it's hard to remember the good things about them. Like some of us tend to be very black and white. We, you know, we put some person on a pedestal and we think they're all perfect and they do everything right. We think another person I can't do anything <laughs> right. They're always wrong, you know. And we, and we, 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 we do that. And so as she was sitting here in the presence of the Lord at the end of the service, the Lord started to bring to her mind the good things her father had done. And, you know, she hadn't expressed those things to him. She hadn't told him, like, you were in many ways a good father to me. And she repented to him. She humbled herself and repented to him. And, and it absolutely opened his heart. He, his mother, her mother, called her and said, you don't know, he keeps that, that letter by the bedside and he's reread it over and over and over and over again. It has deeply, deeply touched him. And then he said, he called her and he says, I want to, I want to have a lunch because I want to restore. I want to restore. Our, uh, and then it just keeps getting better and better. Yeah, she got a fresh testimony. I don't know. Where. The latest is for Christmas. He had asked my mother for a Bible, and I was shocked when he opened up his leather Bible, and he said, I'm going to read it. <laughs> you know, we were given an instruction. Oh, never mind. I'll do this one later. Disobedience is always more costly than obedience. And you think when God gives you an instruction and it's an incredibly hard pill to swallow that that's tough. But disobeying God is going to be tougher. If had we disobeyed God when he told us to give away that offering, oh my gosh, the numbers of blessings we would have missed out on. The absolute miracle power that was unleashed when we sacrificially 
gave every cent that came in in the offering that Sunday. We had so many bills to pay, and we needed a miracle. And God said, give away your offering, and it was costly to us. But the reward was astounding. It, you know, we received back so many times more. We had five times more that night, and, and the kingdom breakthrough and the unity that started to happen. And, um, and so, you know, obedience is costly. It was costly for her to write the letter humbling herself, saying, I'm so sorry for my rebellion, but look at the fruit. It, it, all it did was cost her a little bit of pride, and look at the kingdom blessing. I mean, what, look at what would have not been had she not obeyed that simple instruction. I mean, do, do not think that it pains God's heart when we don't believe him. When he says, do this little thing, and we don't believe him, we can bring joy or pain to the heart of God. It is a pain to his heart not to believe him. He really does know all things. <laughs> so when we were talking today, disobedience is more costly than obedience. It applies to forgiveness. Forgiveness costs us something. Somebody hurt us. Sometimes we're completely at no fault sometimes. And so to forgive that person costs us. Let me tell you, unforgiveness costs you way more. Way more. We'll put you in a prison. I mean, I, could, I can't say it better than how everybody else said it this morning. I mean, point driven home. Do you think God was clear enough? <laughs> I think God was clear enough about the forgiveness. So disobedience is more costly than obedience. Disobeying him and even giving, you know, it's way more costly than obedience. He wants to open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing that you, so great that you can't receive it. But if you won't obey, you can't, you can't do what he wants to do. When you get involved in God's dream, he will get involved in your dream. <laughs> yeah, and you guys are examples of that. They, they lay down their lives in the pursuit of God's dream, you know, for, for other people to prophesy life. Your focus decides your feelings. Um, I've been doing prayer meetings for years and years and years. Uh, when I was at the Miami Vineyard, I probably led a prayer meeting for about seven years. Uh, Kara, uh, Jean was part of that meeting. It was in Michelle Christie's house. And, um, you know, you don't think in 30 years or 20-some-odd years of marriage and five kids and being a pastor of a mega, being on, an on-staff pastor of the mega church, which means you do everything that nobody else wants to do. And you don't think that there were pressures. You don't think there were incredibly discouraging times. I mean, we've passed through financial crises. We almost lost a home, but we still had to sell it. I mean, it just, you know... The bank, it doesn't say foreclosure on our record, but we, we had to sell it. It became, became a noose around our neck. So we know what it is like to have it all, lose it all, go through pressures. And there would be times that, and, you know, you, you, talk about a box, like what happens when you fight with your husband and you're the pastor, you know? I mean, talk about where do I go, what's safe, and what do you do with all this frustration? What do you, what do, you do? I mean, there would be times I would walk into that prayer meeting, and I would be like, help, <laughs> God, help, help, help. And I just would start worshiping, worshiping the Lord, and my focus on him. It's like I walked out of there like, oh, my gosh, is everything like this small? God is so big. I mean, he, my focus on him decided my feelings when I, when I just exalted him and, saw, and, and just meditated in the word of God and just started to release and prophesy the word of God. My, all my feelings changed. And sometimes we focus on things that are false. We focus on, well, either believing a lie about ourselves, but I've been upset about things that have happened relationally with other people, you know, where you have a disagreement and you get all, you're all churned, your stomach, you just feel sick to your stomach, and you're all churned. And a lot of times it's because you walk away thinking the wrong thing. They meant this, you heard this, and you are churned up about a lie. Yeah. And it isn't until you sit down and go head to head 
toe to toe, and you hear the person's heart. And then you, and you work it through. And then the feelings change. So truth will do a big thing to change your feelings. <laughs> Lie can do, lies can do a huge number on your feelings. Okay. I'm sorry. Is this thing, like, I feel like it's, all right. Good. So your focus decides your feelings. And memory is more enslaving than any injustice. So what you remember, do you, are you constantly replaying the hurts? What, what, are you, what are you replaying? If something can happen to you years ago, and you are still, 20 years later, still replaying that thing. So that actual core injury is, is now magnified because you are enslaved by the memory of that thing. One hour in the presence of God will reveal the flaws in your most carefully laid plan. And so we follow that religiously here because we believe (laughs) in a full hour in the presence of God during worship. We believe in that. It transforms me. I'm never, I'm just, and we'll, uh, we'll, in our staff meetings, start making plans and talk about this and should we do this and should we do this and then we just get quiet and we start to seek the Lord and we just get quiet and we just hear. And he says, do this, don't do that. Have you thought about this? And it all... Amen. One hour of the presence of God will do that. One day of favor is worth a thousand days of labor. That's the truth. (laughs) You can work, work, work. You can promote yourself. You can uh, say, oh, I'm going to be some great singer or I'm going to be a great artist and I'm going to do this and I can can call that media company and I can get myself promoted and I could have... um, you know, I could have those professional photographs airbrush me and make me look like, you know, I'm 120 pounds. And, <laughs> and I can work, 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 work to get something I want. And if God just blows on it one little tiny drop of his favor, I could, he can make happen what I could never, ever, ever do. <laughs> so seek the favor of the Lord. What you make happen for others, God will make happen for you. I really, I believe in that. And, um, okay, it's, an, it's time for another embarrassing moment where you're going to lose your reward. <laughs> <laughs> but Nina has given away so many guitars. <laughs> she has, she'll buy, she, she at one time, she bought this gorgeous, what, $2,000 tailor. And God said, give it away. And you don't think she liked playing that thing? But God says, this is a worship leader I want to encourage. So she has given away guitars in the plural sense to many, saying, God believes you. I believe in you. He wants you to have this guitar. What do you think that speaks to somebody? What does that speak to somebody? What, you know, and I, I believe in that. I, I, and I think we... I think we do sometimes a good job of that here. We, um, we believe in raising people up here. I really am not worried about my future, my destiny, my calling. I'm really not, I'm really not, not worried about it. <laughs> I mean, I, love, I think it's important, but it's, um, I really like seeing other people shine. But maybe because that's like, you know, he made me a mom. What mom doesn't like to see their kids do well? And I mean, I know you guys aren't physically all my kids, but, <laughs> but you guys are my kids in a way, in, some, in, a, in a spiritual sense. And so I love to see all of you doing well. I'm not threatened by that. I love it. I love it. Like, like uh, Christine Collins, when we did the women's conference, and Maria Passwaters was up here preaching. 
And oh my gosh, she was off the chain, glorious. The presence of God was just dripping from her. The anointing was pouring out of her pores. And the conviction of God was all over the place. And you could just feel the love of God enter. And I'm in the front row, like, beaming. You know, and Chrissy, she goes, you got more out of it than like, you know, because you were just so, it was so evident how proud you were of her. It was, it was so, you were so proud to see her do so well. So what you make happen for others, God will make happen for you. Amen. What you make happen for others, God, oh, sorry, any movement towards order creates pleasure. Um, any of you who've been to my house, it's not a perfect house, but it's, it's a nice, cozy, warm place. And, but I wasn't always this woman of incredible order that I am today. <laughs> Which that's, that's a laugh. Yeah, actually, my kids sing the song. There's a commercial for Clorox. It says, Mama makes the house fresh like the springtime. And that's, that's my kid's joking song. Mama makes the house fresh like the... <laughs> but, um, but when you walk into a chaotic house. What do you feel when you walk into a place that's been prepared and clean, put in order? What do you feel? What do you feel? What do you um, order in the church when everyone knows who they are and what they're supposed to do? It brings pleasure. Order brings pleasure. I mean, that's one of the, that was one of the attributes of Solomon's uh, time was they marveled at the, the order they marveled at it. And, um, I mean, heaven's a very noisy place. <laughs> but those cherubim know who they are and what they're called to do. And they perform it, you know. And the angels do too. I mean, there's, there's, there's an order in the vast volume of heaven. So, last one, guys. And then I'm going to read some other scripture verses. Your future is decided by who you choose to believe. Who are you going to believe? Are you going to believe the enemy? Are you going to believe God? Who are you going to believe? Are you going to believe the Word of God? The Word of God says, And you shall be unto me a kingdom of kings and priests. Well, this says an exodus of priests, but we know that from the Re book of Revelation and from the book of which one of the Peters, one or two, that we are called to be a kingdom of kings and priests. Do we believe that? It says, We all with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. That's what, what was happening this morning as we were worshiping. We, ju I, we just kept proclaiming that he's the only wise king, that he's holy, 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 the Lord God Almighty, that his kingdom will have no end, that his glory will know no bounds, for the majesty and power of this kingdom's king has come. It was to us that God revealed these things by his spirit, for his spirit searches out everything and shows us God's deep secrets. No one can know a person's thoughts except that that person's own spirit, and no one can know God's thoughts except by God's own spirit. And we have received God's spirit, not the world's spirit. So we can know the wonderful things God has freely given us. When we tell you these things, we do not use words that count, come from human wisdom. Instead, we speak words given to us by the Spirit, using the Spirit's words to explain spiritual truth. Don't you know that all of you together are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God lives in you? So stop deceiving yourselves. If you think you are wise by this world's standards, you need to become a fool. 
to be truly wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness to God, as the scriptures say. He traps the wise in the snare of their own cleverness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise. He knows they are worthless. So don't boast about following a particular human leader, for everything belongs to you. God alone made it possible for you to be in Christ Jesus. For our benefit, God made Christ to be wisdom itself. Wisdom is a person. The person is Jesus. And he made it possible for you to be in Christ, in the very wisdom of God. He is the one who has made us accept.